In a game with so many features, there will inevitably be things that some players disagree on as far as their enjoyment. Some throw down on some TCG, while others haven't even shoveled a deck. Really, you don't even have to look at such a macroscopic level. Even on a micro level, this is true. Some people are Kaya fans, level 90, C6, fully built. And others haven't put one experience book into him. Photon of Fluctuation is my gem. Some others might not even know which tune that is by the name. Point is, there's a lot here to like, dislike, or even just feel indifferent about. And you go about your day because at the end of the day, you're playing how you want, and others can play how they want. You can choose to build Kaya or not, you can choose to play TCG or not. And most mobs in Mondstadt die so quickly that the player probably doesn't even make it to the good parts of Floton of Fluctuation anyway. However, there are some things people feel a little more strongly about than others, and understandably so, as they more directly affect a person's enjoyment of the game with no choice in the matter. When a certain character literally freaking died, many people debated hard about whether or not it was a narratively good choice. There was no say in the matter from the player on this, the character just gets obliterated and you have to accept it. Now, that example is narratively speaking. But there are some things gameplay wise that also fall into this realm. And oh boy, people have opinions about those things. Boy do they have opinions. Early in the game, leading up to version 1.2, there was a low poly blob sitting right in the middle of the map between Mondstadt and Liyue. You could approach it from any angle, but Paimon would always force you to turn around with the classic how about we explore this later thing if you got too close. From 1.0 to 1.2 might not sound like a long time nowadays, but early on in the game, that was an eternity. When 1.2 finally dropped and we loaded up the game, the low poly Nintendo 64 graphics mountain was gone, and in its place was the majestic dragon spine we have today. Our very first expansion was here, the expansion that technically started it all, even before Inazuma. I immediately started exploring the area. There were new Ice Hilichiro enemies, puzzles to solve, stories to get through. It was hype. Plus, there was this fun and immersive new mechanic that really sold the point of a cold mountain. Sheer cold. Stray too far from a heat source and your cold meter goes up. If the cold meter reaches the top, lose health until you can warm up. Oh, they really want to sell this idea, I see. And that was how I saw it anyway. It really sold the point to me that this place was supposed to be cold. Not just your average cold, but cold enough to just straight up kill you. With the abundance of torches and heating zones in the area, I never found it to be an extreme hassle. Just something fun and immersive. And as I would discover through lore, an early and bitter example of the powers above. Whoever dropped this Skyfrost nail down on this mountain and basically turned it into a winter apocalypse. One, had some serious power and tools at their disposal, and two, meant freaking business when they did it. To me, this fit extremely well into the world of Genshin, and the effects were twofold. 
Tevat is a world in which seven elements exist alongside one another. To me, this was a showcase of the cryo element at its most extreme. Sure, characters like Kyo could use cryo, but what about the element on a more macroscopic level? This was the answer. The cold and bitter answer. You couldn't run from it, you couldn't escape it. This form of cryo enveloped you, and the best you could do was keep close to a flame. To me, this signaled that the elements were a much larger part of the world than just the visions that characters hold. To that, breathe the elements. They were integral. The sheer code mechanic, in my eyes, was world building through player experience. As I said, I think the effect of this addition was twofold as well. Not only was it well done to show the macroscopic applications of the elements on this world, but it also really put in perspective just what we were dealing with on a higher level. This mountain wasn't just frozen for the sake of being frozen. This was a deliberate act by higher powers. Centuries ago. And the effects linger to this day. Even now, centuries later, we couldn't traverse this land without dying to the sheer cold. That's a heck of a narrative implication. It really put into focus that Tevat had some huge players in its lore. This mountain full of hindrances and resistances was here, free for the exploring, but no. You will deal with the same consequences as those centuries ago. You will respect whatever awesome power did this. This to me is immersive. There's a common narrative trope called show don't tell, in which the idea is that showing the audience something is more immersive than simply telling them something. As well, it fosters a deeper appreciation of the thing in question. Showing rather than telling is highly valued in storytelling. An author can tell you Lumine was cold as she walked the path in search of warmth. Or the author can say, a frosty haze escaping her mouth, Lumine shivered as she took another labored step towards the orange flicker of a torch on the horizon. The frosty breath and Lumine shivering tells you she's cold, but it also illustrates it. The labored steps tells you she's walking, but it also illustrates it. Heading towards the orange flicker of a torch on the horizon implies to you that she's looking for warmth, but it also illustrates it. This is what good, vivid narration does. Doesn't just tells, it shows. Video games are an interactive medium, which means that telling can come in many forms, from exposition to the setting itself. But showing? Showing the audience something in an interactive medium involves making them experience the thing itself. The lore tells us that Dragonspine is cold. The snow on the ground tells us that Dragonspine is cold. But what's one way to make me truly respect this coldness for what it is? Add sheer cold and make me respect it. This is the equivalent of showing rather than telling to me. Now, there is a limit to showing and not telling, particularly in interactive media. For instance, it's an adventure game where you're out on a lone adventure. In a counter to my point, someone could say, Well, if that's the case, then why don't you have to eat and drink every day, or suffer death? To really show the point that you're a traveler out here on an adventure. 
that's showing rather than telling. Which, yes, that's true, that's showing. But the narrative significance of doing that would be of little to no value. You see, there's value in sheer cold in a narrative sense. It shows what the people who inhabited this mountain went through centuries ago by making us experience it. It also shows that the effects are so powerful that the results linger even today. It also shows the raw power of those above. And it shows what cryo could be on a macroscopically applied level. There's a lot of narrative value in this. As for making the traveler eat and drink every day because they're an adventurer, there's not as much narrative value in doing that. Everywhere we move in the game, we are traveling and adventuring. We are climbing Dragonspine itself because we are an adventurer. We are reminded every second of the game that the Traveler is an adventurer. Adding any more than that is just superfluous. Some might say that Sure Cold itself is superfluous, which to be fair, it is debatable. I'm not saying my opinion here of the immersiveness of its addition is right, no questions, no debate. But when considered from an interactive standpoint, world building standpoint, and show don't tell angle, I personally find it to be well executed. I'd go so far as to say I'd like more of it. Which we kind of did have more concepts like it. When we went to Inazuma, upon arrival to Yashiori Island, we encountered an endless thunderstorm like no other. Lightning strikes every other second. You couldn't move without lightning blasting away at you. Heck, you couldn't even talk to NPCs without lightning blasting away at you. It was truly a display of Electro at its most aggressive extreme. There's lightning, and then there's Yashiori Island. There's snow, and then there's Dragon Spine. Tevat breathes the elements. Bell Thunder in Inazuma was also a really cool mechanic, which exists for its own purposes and reasons, owing to the relevance of Electro right in Inazuma. Right right Again, you will respect it. Criticisms that I've seen against mechanics like Sure Code and Bell Thunder are that they inhibit natural exploration and the player's pacing. It's an open world exploration game, they say. The point of the game is to freely explore, this goes against that. To which my answer to that is, no, not really. In my Sumeru Desert was actually great essay, a comment by user Innsflare1 stuck with me, and I fully agree with it. Innsflare1 wrote, and I quote, People keep thinking that open world means that you can go wherever you want, whenever you want, instead of it just not having many losing screens. Reality is open world, but if I tried to enter the Fort Knox domain without getting the proper clearance first, or exit the 70th story of a building without first getting access to the stairs or elevators, I'm probably going to get a quick game over. To which I replied, That's a perfect analogy, I like that. And in an open world, you simply have the freedom to tackle a particular quest or objective, or head off in another direction and do something else. It doesn't mean that if you decide to tackle a particular objective though, there won't be impediments or obstacles. These comments were in response to the desert's clearance system, but I think they can be applied on a more general level as well. It's an open world game, sure, but there's going to be obstacles and impediments. 
you are playing a game after all. In fact, I'd wager that obstacles and impediments are what make an open world game a game. Without the obstacles and impediments, it's just an open world. Enemies, danger, obstacles, hindrances, inconveniences. That's the part where the game comes in, in my opinion. If you were to say, boot up an interactive car experience, and you just drive this car down a straight lane, with no other cars on the lane, no timer, no finish line, no nothing, that's just a driving simulator. But add some other cars for enemies and hindrances, add some turns for danger, add a record timer for you to try and beat or a finish timer to inconvenience you, and maybe some cross traffic for obstacles. Now, you don't have a driving simulator, you have an interactive racing game. It's the addition of these things that make it a game. Which, going back to the show don't tell argument, that isn't to say you can't overdo the obstacles and impediments in a game. The same as you can definitely overshow in an attempt to not just tell. But I don't subscribe to that argument that these are unnecessary, pointless mechanics for the sake of being annoying. These mechanics in Genshin are tastefully done, with narrative relevance, and honestly they aren't even 100% unavoidable. Torches do exist in Dragonspine after all, and if you really just hate the sheer code mechanic, you can even cook goulash to eat, which dramatically reduces the rate at which your code accumulates. As far as Inazuma goes, the lightning on Yashiori Island stops after a particular quest, and most of the bell thunder in the game completely dissipates after a few quests as well. It's a bit suffocating when you're doing those quests, but again, that's the point. It's a game. It makes it all the more satisfying when you do get rid of it all. These areas are written around these elements. These areas exist because of the elements. We should have to deal with the elements when we enter these areas. Kokomi has a quote which she gets memed about often, but honestly I'm going to let her cook. To survive hardship, you must prepare for hardship. She's not wrong, and the same as to survive hardship, you must prepare for hardship. To conquer hardship, you must survive hardship. When you reach the peak of Dragon Spine, or get rid of all the Bell Thunder and Lightning in Inazuma, you've conquered hardship through surviving it. Wear that badge proudly. Or don't, but eh, realize it's a game, and at times you're going to have to do that. That isn't saying you have to like it. As stated in the beginning, there's so many things in this game that people are naturally going to like and dislike different things. But maybe at least from a storytelling, narrative, and show don't tell standpoint, this at least helps you to respect what it's trying to do, whether you like the actual implementation of it or not. As for me, I welcome this kind of implementation. It's great world building in my opinion. I'm glad Fontaine went all out and made us have to swim through half the map. Again, it's the hydro element to the extreme macroscopic level. The same as Dragon Spine is the macroscopic example of Cryo. Only swimming in Fontaine is less of a hindrance and more of a straight up mechanic, but that makes sense. The reason Sure Code is a hindrance on Dragon Spine is because the Sky Frost Nail itself was an aggressive action taken towards the region. The waters of Fontaine don't have to feel so aggressive because. They're just the waters of Fontaine. But as we move forward, I really hope there's a 
dead heat mechanic in the heart of Natlin. Thanks for listening.